meeting of our first responder suicide awareness coalition. We really appreciate it. Uh, we have a really great crowd today. Uh, this organization spurred from a lot of conversations, lots of moving parts. And so it's really exciting that we can all come together like this and, uh, and work to, to hopefully get our uh, first responder suicide numbers down to zero. We're very fortunate today to have a, a great speaker that I know um, Salt Lake City Fire Department has a lot of respect for. And it's awesome that we get to introduce him to this group. Um, since we're such a multifaceted group, we have a lot of really smart minds in the room. So it'll be great to, to hear from him. So again, thank you Salt Lake City for hosting us. Uh, this is an excellent partnership that we've got with, again, a lot of moving parts all the way from, uh, from Logan to St. George, it seems like. So uh, I'm going to turn the time over to Chief Mike Fox from Salt Lake City to introduce our speaker today. Um, at the end, if there's any questions for our speaker, he'll be able to, uh, to help you out with that. So the little microphone. All right. So I can talk loud enough. I don't need that. First of all, thank you all for being here again here at Salt Lake City. We're, we're proud to host this. You're the people that are going to make this happen, okay? We're trying to make this move forward with Salt Lake City. We need to make this move forward throughout the whole state. So thank you for being here and being willing to take this back uh, to your agencies and your departments. It, I was proud to be able to introduce Rich today. Rich and I have become very good friends over the last couple of years in dealing with this. At least I can say we're friends. He might say something different. But Rich has provided all kinds of training to our department on not only mind shielding, the suicide prevention, how to deal with issues, PTSD. Okay? We're, we're trying to bring that not only to our existing firefighters, but to our recruits as they're coming in. Because that's really where we're gonna change the culture, right? We can provide the training to the people that are already established, but we need to bring that up through and make it part of the culture as people are coming in. Rich has been a social worker and a professor for almost 20 years now. He's worked with vets, works with first responders, police officers, and firefighters. So we're very proud to have him here. We're proud of the work that he's done here in Salt Lake City, and we hope you appreciate it as much as we do. Thanks, Thank Rich. Yeah. I just got back from a trip, so if the slideshow's a little rough and the spellings, that's, you'll, you'll bear with me, right? Uh, so the presentation's about two things today about why people take their life. I'm going to show you exactly why. The very process that happens. Then the next is how do we prevent it? How do we get it to zero? We can. We really can. And we can do it in a very cost effective way. But before I show you why people take their lives and how we can prevent it, I want you to get to know me just a little bit. Um, one of the key ways we prevent suicide is building relationships, right? You gotta know who you're working with. So this is me and my boy, Mesa Verde. Um, I get a little time off in the summer being a professor. And so we took a camping trip down there. This is Luke Powell. Yeah, we did name him after Skywalker, yes. Uh, this is last week up in Stanley. Uh, he likes to paddleboard with me. He, he was wearing flotation, I promise. So I'm an old river guide ski instructor that decided I wanted to work with combat veterans. And I spent 12 years uh, doing exposure therapy and working on our suicide prevention and intervention team. Uh, at the VA, I went through 23 suicides. Um, every single one of them was devastating. Then I left the VA and I chose to move my skill sets and career to Midvale where I worked with traumatized children in Title I schools and built our suicide prevention team. I went through several suicides there. Um, the most recent was a young man, 17, his whole life in front of him, right? Captain of a sports team. He was actually the peer mentor to my little brother. Amazing kid. And he was living kind of a double life. Like everyone saw him as the hero, the hard worker, person that was going to succeed, but inside he was struggling with depression, with insecurity, with worry and concern. With how am I going to succeed? And he was silent. And why was he silent? Well, why are we all silent? We don't want the stigma attached that I'm weak, I might not be able to carry this on my own. What's going to happen to me if people find out? Well, because we were silent, he was silent, and he took his life, hung himself in his closet and his sister found him. 
Now I'm a recent parent. I'm old to be a recent parent. We, you know, we did a few degrees before this. I cannot possibly think of anything worse on this planet than losing a child. I, I just can't. And so for me, this is a, a real issue. And it's a real issue not just because I'm a mental health professional, not because I work with combat vets. It's a real issue because there was a time when I was suicidal myself. This is like six years into a career at the VA hospital. I'm 260 pounds. I'm going through a rough time in my marriage. I'm living in my grandma's basement because we're in transition. I'm on medications for sleep, right? I had PTSD as well from several events. I was drowned in Costa Rica kayaking. I, somehow they rolled me up in CPR and I was fine. Uh, I was shot at in Idaho. That one kind of freaked me out. But you know what really got to me? Day in and day out hearing combat stories, being exposed to the trauma they went through, that vicarious aspect. And little by little, it took a piece out of me. Every time I met with a veteran and I heard what he went through, it just it hit at me. And I can't go home and tell my wife what my day was like, right? I mean, how was your day, hon? Wonderful. I had my lesson plan, went really well. The kids really met their learning objectives. How about you? Fine. I'm not going to say, yeah, you know, today I had a veteran tell me about a child he had to shoot because the child had C4 strapped to the ankle and the parents were, hey, you don't share that. And so you lose yourself a little bit. So here I found myself being silent too. I'm not going to tell anyone, everyone that as a mental health professional, I'm struggling, that my marriage is, is challenged. And so I put on that smiley face every day, right? But in the back of my head, I'm like, boy, it would sure be nice to check out. Lucky for me, I came across MindShield and I learned how to take trauma and become stronger because of it, become resilient. Trauma is actually a wonderful thing. I mean, if humans weren't designed to overcome trauma, right, we'd be screwed because <laughs> life is traumatic. And so the goal is to take trauma and become resilient by experiencing it in your executive brain. If you experience trauma in your primitive brain, it destroys you. You experience it in your executive brain, you become resilient, more compassionate, more humble, more empathetic. But we got to break the silence. That's the first step. We can no longer, as a community, be silent to suicide. So, here are the risk factors. And I'm going to kind of go through four themes of what sets someone up for risk at suicide. And if you guys would like this presentation, you can have it. I'll email it. So you don't need to take notes unless you'd really like to. Trauma. Well, what's the likelihood a first responder is going to experience trauma? Like 100%, right? The biggest risk factor for suicide is exposure to trauma. Last year, 124 police officers lost their life in the line of duty, right? 126 committed suicide. You are more likely in the dangerous job as a first responder to lose your life by your own gun, by your own medications, than by a danger of the job. It's because you were exposed to trauma. What that trauma does is exposes you to grief and loss, right? And not the type of grief and loss that you experience when you lose, like my grandpa, he died a couple years back. He was 88, lived a wonderful life. Um, and he passed. That was, you know, took us a couple weeks. Every holiday we represent him. I'm talking grief and loss that's overwhelming. Where you start to change your perception about the world. I mean, day in and day out, listening to combat vets talk about the horrors they experience, it started to change my perception of the world, right? When you see grief and loss every day, it starts to have a significant impact on you, the relationships you have how you see and perceive. Significant life challenges. Divorce, medical issues, addiction. Um, anything that becomes significant starts to add to that weight. And I have a little challenge for you as we do this presentation. If you see any one of these that fits you, just make a check somewhere. Let's see how many we, we add up. Because I would guess as first responders, almost every one of these things you're going to have experienced. Now this is a big one. 
this is a big one for me, and this is a big one for first responders, is that fear of failure. And then when we do fail, because when we fail, what happens as first responders? People get hurt or they die, right? So when we fail, it has an added consequence to it. And then the conflict, internal and external, that comes to failure. But that constant anxiety of, I gotta save lives. I've got to be there on my A game every moment. That starts to wear us down. Every one of us in this room, I guarantee you're living a double life. I do. I, I still do as a professor. There's the, the life my wife and child see when I come home, right? Smiley, happy. I don't share with them what I do, what I hear, what I see, what I experience. The life my friends see, they're all river guides. No, a few of them are first responders. And we, we, I can talk with them, but most of them are in real estate or business, IT and tech. We just got back from a 12-day fishing boating trip in Stanley. We, we don't talk about what we see. So there's the life that everybody sees. Success, Rich is happy. He's on his A game. He's a professor. But then there's the life inside of us, right? that constantly spins. Well, which one are you gonna feed? And if life is out of balance, you tend to feed the conflict inside, and that wears on you. Substance use. And we're gonna talk about substance use different than addiction. Substance use is not just a glass of wine that I wanna have with dinner, but the three or four I have to have to relax, right? It doesn't create an addiction. But it does start to wear and tear, and you wake up not feeling 100%, right? And, uh, maybe you, you overdo it a few times. But that substance use, if it's used to quiet what's going on up here, that's when we start to worry, right? And significant medical issues. What's the likelihood a first responder is going to have a significant medical issue, <laughs> right? Why is that an issue? One, because you start to feel like a failure, but here's the second. Your access to pain medications. The likely of overdosing, the likely of mixing alcohol with, let's say, two or three oxycodone and going to sleep and not really ever waking back up. It's that access to lethal means that the medical issues really become a challenge for. It's that chronic pain, right? Day in and day out. I have a buddy right now, and we're, we're quite worried about him. He has a rare neurological disorder where his jaw is always in pain, 24-7. And he has terrible headaches because of it. Some days it's not so bad, but most days on a scale of 1 to 10, his pain's a 7 to an 8. 50% of all people with this neurological disorder take their lives. I mean, it's, it's a scary thing. Well, the same thing applies to us as first responders. If we find ourselves in chronic pain, at some point it becomes, or some point it can become too much. This is kind of one theme of risk factors. Um, let's add a few more to it. Let's go with more of the mental health route. What's the likelihood you as first responders, again, are gonna experience trauma? Highly likely. Without support, without being able to shield your mind, the likelihood of you getting post-traumatic stress is in the high 90%. It's going to happen because you're exposed to trauma. And so what does it mean to have post-traumatic stress? It means that I think about it a lot. I can't really take my mind off it. It means that you know, maybe I don't go to crowded concerts anymore because I know what happens at crowded concerts. I, I just don't like the noise and the motion. I can't really, I can't figure things out. I don't know where the exit is, right? Maybe you dream about it. Uh, maybe you don't want to talk about it. Maybe you're a little bit detached more than you've ever been. Like if you compare and contrast before I experienced the trauma, I'm kind of a different person now. And the world looks different to me. And you're just kind of like always roused up. Like it's, we'll be in a car, my wife and I. I'll be driving or she'll be driving. And we'll hear the sirens come on, police, off, police sirens, right? Breath check. Okay, we're fine. We haven't been drinking. And then that police car will go by. I'm like, whew. And she's like, whew. And guess what happens to her mind as an educator? She's back to listening to the music, you know? 
to Beyonce. Guess what I'm thinking? Where's that person going to? What happened? How many vehicles are going to respond? Is this going to be in front of me? Do I need to exit off to make sure we don't get caught? My mind won't shut down because I know what happens in traumatic situations. That's what trauma is. And that's what it does to us. And it's with us 24-7. So here's what's crazy. Question for you. Anyone know how much we spend to support a firefighter having a safe body? $6,500 for their full outfit. How much do we spend to protect their minds? How much are we spending to protect your minds? Most departments don't go for Zero. Right. Zero. But you're more likely to die because of your mind being exposed to trauma than your body. Trauma is a real thing, and we need to stop being silent. But it's not a bad thing. I wear my PTSD badge with pride. You know what that says about me? I've lived some life, right? And I know how to work with it. It's made me a stronger, better, more humble, more emotional person. That's why I'm here. And that's the message that we need to get across, is you're not damaged, you're not broken, you're not a failure for having survived. You're an amazing person, and there are simple tools we can use to help you get through it. In addition, what post-traumatic stress often opens the door to is depression. That sadness, that tiredness, that worn out, I just don't have the energy. Or I'm just, I can't. You know, I mean, people say, just do it. I, I just can't, right? Or more so with first responders, the anxiety. That constant state of hyper arousal, right? Maybe we're a little more controlling, a little more critical. <laughs> That's the anxiety. This is where addiction comes in. Because if over time I want to quiet my mind and quiet my body, but I can't, what am I going to use? Well, six beers and a shot kind of did it last night. Well, let's try two shots and a 12 pack. And over time, or, you know, these pain pills are amazing, right? Take one of these and I just, everyone likes me again. <laughs> but then one or two pain pills turns into 24 a day. Six beers and a few shots or maybe half a bottle of wine turns into, on the weekends, maybe putting down a fifth. And then having to drink the next morning just to get out of bed and just to study the nerves. And maybe I manage my addiction by right before I go on, I detox myself, right? And it sucks. I'm agitated, irritable, and I'm sweaty and uncomfortable. But then I'm pretty manageable during the job. But as soon as I get off, oh yeah, party time. And then I wake up and I'm just in this cycle. This is what addiction starts to do. And this is where you see that double life because no one wants to say, yeah, I have a substance use problem and I need some help. Anger management, and then significant marital and family conflict. You know where one of the highest divorce rates on the planet is? First responders. <laughs> Why? Because we're traumatized, depressed, anxious, addicted, and angry, <laughs> right? It's because the job is heavy and it has an impact on your soul, and that starts to bleed out in your relationships. Then you add significant. I read that even ER uh, doctors have a high uh, marital breakup rate. Oh, yeah. If you're a social worker, a nurse, an ER doc, if you're a first responder of any type, police officer, firefighter, paramedic, oh, yeah. Your exposure to trauma has a significant impact on your relationship. Absolutely. And then if this bleeds out into work, that conflict, uh, we start to have, create, are you starting to see, we're starting to create a pretty serious situation now. So we've got all of these trauma pieces, and now we're adding the mental health piece. Well, let's, let's, let's up the ante a little bit. Let's, let's look at two more kind of themes. Here's where it gets scary. Here's where we start to see the suicide emerge. If a person has access to lethal means. What's interesting, I don't know if it's interesting, is most first responders have access to lethal means, right? Um, some type of medication, a firearm, 
but we, we have access. We know where to get it. And we are desensitized to death. It's not scary for us. We see it every day, right? So you add these mental health pieces, these work and emotional pieces, and then you add being flooded, believing that people are better off without you, right? When death looks better than life, and not so much death, it's checking out, right? Just, I just need a break. I just need a moment in time where I'm just, whew, I just, I can't handle this anymore. Feeling alone, and what I mean is alone, is no one understands me. No one is here. Like, I've got all these people that surround me. I find, I find that first responders are some of the friendliest, funnest people, and you have these huge circles of people around you. But we're also some of the loneliest people on this planet. They don't really, people really know what's going on inside of us. We're great at living that double life. So that just, no one knows what's going on inside of me. If they did, they probably wouldn't like me. And I would be alone. And when you see no other choices. So suicide doesn't happen like, God, one day I'm here and the next day I'm suicidal, right? It's a process. Months and months of this building. Of life's going great, you're holding it together, then you're holding it together less, and then you start to have the conflicts in the relationships at work. You start to feel bad about your behavior. You're frustrated with self. Uh, you start to become less productive, less good, you, and you're trying your best to hold it together. You're doing everything possible to live that double life. And at some point comes, you're like, I don't know if I can live this double life anymore. I'm going to be exposed, and it's going to happen soon. I'd rather check out before I'm exposed. That's what we start to see is when you have no other viable choices. Or the choice is, let's see, a 90-day residential treatment. Uh, where I detox and I'm provided mental health and addictive supports, followed by having to go to AA or some type of aftercare um, support for 18 months. How many here are excited about being involved in, in mental health and aftercare supports for 18 months? Okay, by the time someone comes to me and they're suicidal, it's not a quick, easy fix, right? It's not, let's do some mind shield skill sets. It's usually a detox around an addiction issue. It's usually how are we going to help you get divorced or stay together. It's how are we going to help you hold your finances together, your family together. How are we going to keep your, you employed because you're in trouble with your work. It's a mess. It's very expensive. You're talking thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, $60,000 and months and months of treatment. Or we could train our cadets for a couple hours and do ongoing KSAs, right? I mean, if a firefighter walks into a fire or a car wreck or a chemical disaster without their gear, right? And they're going to get seriously injured. You're talking skin, graft, you're talking all kinds of medical care. I mean, Chief Fox could speak to just what happened in 9-11, the sacrifice you made. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's why we spend $6,500 on protective gear to do the best we can to set you up for success on the job. Why are we not providing mental health supports? Because by the time someone comes to me and they're suicidal, it is complex. By the time a cadet comes to me and says, hey, I'd like some training to protect my mind, it's very easy. And here's how this works. It's about helping a person become resilient by moving trauma experiences into your executive brain. I'm going to show you exactly how, but we're not quite done looking at this suicide thing. I want to add one more piece. And we're going to kind of go back to the beginning. Here's where all of this starts. Here is the cause. Here's the reason people take their lives when they're first responders. This. This is trauma. This is what it does to you if you don't have skill sets. This is what it looks like. I'm guessing every single person in this room has at least two or three of these going on right now. I had all of them at one point. All of this was what was driving my challenges, my relationship issues. This is the root cause of suicide. It's the trauma you're exposed to and not having the skill sets to work through it. So before we move into solutions, how we work through this, the skill sets you need to protect your mind, the questions, comments, thoughts, 
I'm kind of curious about your reaction to this presentation so far. Yes, sir. I have a question. I have to lay out first. I am not a first responder. I never have been a first responder, so I can't, I can't come from that point of view. But what all of you do is so incredibly valuable in the community and cannot be done by anybody else. How does one turn that service-oriented piece and the trauma that comes with that service into a positive thing? Oh, I'm going to show you. Okay. That's what I was hoping. I'm going to show you. And, but just to give you an idea, have you had some challenges in your life? Sure, of course. And have those challenges, what have they done for you as a person? Well, your character, who you are. Yeah. yeah. You think about sports. I mean, is sports challenging? I'm a skier, backpacker, biker. Uh, one of the traumas I experienced was an avalanche up Silver Fork Canyon. I got buried. Let me tell you, I'm a much better backcountry skier because of that experience. <laughs> Trauma, conflict, life challenge makes us stronger if we choose it to be. That's, that's what this whole presentation is going to be, is how you choose to be resilient. Or it can take you down a different pathway, where you become frustrated, depressed, concerned, basically stuck in that fight, flight, or freeze primitive brain. Yes, sir. I think, uh, and you just alluded to it, it sounds like you're going to go down that path. Um, my, I spent 12 years as a first responder. That was what I did before my position now. One of the hardest parts uh, for us, and, and you might be, like I said, going down this path, is processing. So it's easy to recognize all of this stuff, right. but I think one of the uh, big components that, and, and I can say this because I felt like I drank the punch for a long time, is processing all that stuff, processing what you just saw, processing that, hey, I'm, I'm a cranky guy right now because I'm burned out, I'm fried. Um, can you just comment on the process yeah, part? Yeah. Are you going to touch on that? Oh, oh yeah, I'm going right. to go through the process. But I want to I, I wanna leave this group with a consistent message. How much time and training was put into you learning how to be a first responder, working with the equipment, how to handle a crisis situation? How much ongoing training did you receive during that 12-year process? Did you ever, even one time, get tools to learn how to process what you saw mentally? No. No wonder you're having a hard time processing. You were never taught. You can't master a skill set if, one, you don't know what the tools are, and two, you don't practice them. I mean, imagine taking me right now. I have a hard time parking here anyways, as, as Captain Fox knows throwing me in a fire engine and saying, there's a call, go take care of it. I don't have a clue what to do. I don't even know how to put the gear on. I like to try it sometimes. <laughs> it ta how much practice does it take for you to be good at your job as a first responder? How much training did you need to go through? How much training have you gone through for your mind? Zero. That's what needs to change. That's what we need to no longer be silent about is you need training. And if you have training, you'll protect your mind. You won't have to deal with all this stuff. And I'm not just like feeding you punch. I experienced it. This was me <laughs> every day. 260 pounds on the edge of divorce, wanting to check out because that was all I could be. And then I learned the tool sets and I practiced them to become resilient. This isn't me anymore. I'm back to being rich. Fun dad. Other questions before we shift gears? Yes, sir. Rich, the only thing I would add is that before this has become more normalized, is new recruits would look to the experienced firefighters on the crew on how to deal with this. Absolutely. And it has to be a culture change. Yeah, Everyone has to be on board. I think that's changing, and I think that culture of silence or just laughing about it is, we realize it doesn't work. Yeah. So I think that's really nice. Absolutely. Um, and I want to be really clear again. Two consistent messages. One, you need the mind, the trained of the mind to deal with trauma. The longer you're a first responder and you go without it, the more these symptoms become part of your life, the longer it takes to work through it. it, it, it that's what we're talking about here. The quicker we can train, the quicker this isn't going to happen in the first place. Other questions for me? Okay, here's how you stop suicide. Here's how we're going to get suicide to zero. 
I'm going to show you the exact process. These are preventative factors, and they need to outweigh the risk factors at a 5 to 1 ratio. 3 to 1 for most individuals. For first responders, it's got to be 5 to 1 or higher. These have to be in place. A purpose, a goal, that feeling of value, right? Because what's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite of that leads you to suicide. Okay? That family connection. Well, what does trauma do if you don't have skill sets? Y'all heard of the thousand mile stare? You're emotionally numb, you're tired, you just don't have it. Like I kind of gave the example, how's your day, hon? Wonderful. How's yours? Fine. <laughs> that fat trauma can really impact family connection because you're critical, you're honorary, you're upset, you're disconnected, you're out there. If you don't have the tool sets to deal with trauma, the family connection falls apart. And then you get set up for suicide. Friendship, financial stability, all part of what trauma can collapse. This is my favorite, vacations and fun. But that's different than fun and being on vacation when you're traumatized. So here's what a vacation looked like for me when I was having all of those symptoms of PTSD. Backcountry ski tour with Amber. I'm chugging up the hill, right? I'm like, hey, come on. You need to, you need to keep up, babe. Snow's falling. I want to get six laps in. Oh, can you just chill out a little bit, Rich? I'm like, no, I can't just chill out. Did you bring your transceiver? OK, transceiver drill right now. Boom, go. <laughs> we call it Meltdown Mountain because by the time we got up to the top, I was so honorary, so critical. I took this wonderful vacation moment and turned it into an absolute meltdown for her. That's what trauma does. Now I go on vacation, and I'm different. I'm back to me. I'm patient, fun, flexible. Everything doesn't have to be scheduled. And if there's a change, I, I can actually deal with it. <laughs> so you've got to be able to transition from work you to fun play you and have it be genuine, the real you. Okay, success. I, I know I said three to one. It's really got to be higher. These things have to outweigh the challenges of your job by at least five to one. Otherwise, the imbalance sits in. You got to have mind tools that support executive brain function. So real simply put, you have two parts of your brain, your primitive and your executive. Your primitive is in charge of fight, flight, and freeze, right? It's in charge of aggression and depression. Then you have your executive brain, prefrontal cortex, limbic system, neocortex, all that cool stuff. That's in charge of processing, understanding. You said processing, processing, understanding, exploring. It's the executive brain that helps you take your entire life and see it in the context, make abstract connections, learn and grow, and then go, OK, I get it. I can incorporate that into my life. It's the part of your brain that I'm at a concert at Redfish Lake and I don't have to sit in the back of the crowd anymore, just make sure I see everybody, because I know the people behind me probably aren't dangerous. That's what the executive brain does. Well, what happens is first responders get locked in their primitive brain. You're in a constant state of fight, mostly fight, flight, or freeze. Not often freeze, because you've been trained so well to respond to crisis. So it's that fight or flight, right? So flight, that's how I check out. The fight, that's how I'm hyper aroused. That's, that's how I set things up so that no one gets hurt, right? It's that part of you that's always going, always just kind of active. You got to be able to shut that system down. That system is only designed to work no more than 30 minutes at a time before it starts to have significant impact on your brain and body. It starts to break you down. You have the ability, and I'm going to show you how to do it, to turn that right off at will. And that's what we need to train our firefighters and first responders to do. OK, here's the big one. This is part of the challenge. All this stuff's great. But what if you don't have access to it, right? I mean, I'm one person. <laughs> I have a full-time job and a kid. Uh, and I do this for free right now because <laughs> it's important to me. But at some point, we have to create resources, access. And right now, you all know how to access the care. Probably, probably you might, may or may not know how to access it. But you don't trust it. 
Do you feel supported? That if you access it, people will have your back? That it's not going to impact your job or family? There's a huge stigma right now that if you have a mental health issue, you're broken and damaged and you can't do the job. That is not true. It's an opportunity to learn and grow. But people do not, every firefighter I have worked with, every police officer, every combat vet, every first responder said, Rich, I know how to get help. I'm afraid to. I don't want the consequences of what will come. I don't trust the process. I don't trust how I'll be viewed. And so they don't reach help. They don't seek out. That's what this group can do. This is how we can change things by not being silent and create support for access to that mental health. For that to be seen no differently than if you get cut on a job, right? A lash, a, a gash, or even let's say, I wonder how many of you in here have ever been stuck by something. <laughs> Hopefully not something that had HIV attached to it. If you get injured on the job, you go take care of it, right? And you're not allowed back on the job, right? If, if you've got an open gash wound. And when you, everyone during that time when you get stitches, right, is so supportive and they all have your back. Well, who has your back when you have something going on up here? It's normal. It's part of the human development because you've been exposed to trauma. The process to get help for a cut needs to be the same process to get help for when things aren't clicking up here because you've been exposed to trauma and you're having a normal human reaction. Why is it not seen as normal for us to have a human reaction to trauma? I'm, I'm very confused by this. I mean, it's normal to get pinched. You say, ow, but you see a trauma, and we're not supposed to react to that? Let me ask, how many of you had a reaction to some of the terror that's been going across this country? The nightclub one really got to me bad. Well, why don't we have a normal reaction? Why do we not see our own internal process as normal? This is kind of the movement we need to make, is it's OK that you're struggling with having been exposed to trauma. So these are the preventative factors. This is the toolbox, OK? This is what needs to be part of your KSAs, your training, your daily practice. This is what feeds my executive brain and keeps my PTSD manageable. I'm going to just kind of go through these briefly, give you a taste. The first one is tuning into your senses. I know that sounds simple, kind of goofy, maybe hokey hocus pocus. But tuning in your senses is how you move from your primitive brain to your executive brain. I'm guessing you're all listening to my voice, but not a single one of you are paying attention to your body, right? So can I ask you real quick to just kind of notice what's going on in your body right now? I'm tense because you're all staring at me, <laughs> right? And we got all these people out there. Hi. <laughs> Just take a deep breath. What do you notice when you just take a deep breath? More relaxed. You oxygenate your blood, but you move from primitive to executive brain functioning. It's that simple. But what you need to be aware of is that conscious action. I am taking a deep breath because that helps me process information, helps me deal with the situation. It's not just because I need a deep breath. It actually is helping me feel more comfortable around you all. And what that deep breath is doing for me right now, it's helping me put my storylines in check. Most of y'all live your life in storylines. Like right now, when my body's tense, my mind's spinning, and I'm in my primitive brain, I'm like, is my fly down? She's looking at me kind of funny. And do they, are they even listening to me? And Fox has his arm folded. Is he pissed off? Am I said, did I cross the line? Those are my storylines, right? I have this great storyline I share it a lot where I'll call my wife. And she's a very busy person. She's way more important than I am. And she won't answer, right? So what do I do? I text, please call me. And when she doesn't text right back, guess what I do? Text her again, right? But with an ASAP, capital letters. And then when she doesn't text me back, is she dead? Like, is she on the freeway? Is like the phone off to the side? Is she crawling to it right now just <laughs> so she can offer that last, we love you, Rich? I'm like, nah, I know. I saw her flirt with TJ, our neighbor across the street. Yeah, I bet she and TJ are, yeah. Ooh, when I get home, ah. 
So when she answers the phone five minutes later, like, what's the emergency? And for me, it's like, I, you know, I can't find a pair of socks. Either she's dead or she's having an affair, right? That's what our storylines do to us. Well, let's take the storylines to trauma. What stories are going through your heads when you're agitated, when you're irritable, when you're cranky, when you can't relax, when you drink too much, or when you're upset, or when you can't wind down, or when you perceive the world a way that no one else does? It's these storylines. And then when things aren't going the way they're supposed to, these storylines start to spin out of control. You know what causes suicide? Storylines. If you can quiet the storylines, we can get suicide down to zero. And we do that with these simple tools of like taking a breath, being aware of our storyline, thought labeling. Here's the big one. So what causes a storyline? How many of you on a day-to-day -day basis have your expectations not met? My favorite is I signal and no one lets me in and no one lets me in. And so I have something in my pocket for all those people, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then my storyline starts to spin into where is our, what is going on with our planet? Like Utah is supposed to be one of the most polite, happy states, and not a single person's letting me in. Our state is going down. You know what? I'm bugging out. It's zombie apocalypse time. All because someone wouldn't let me in because I signaled. Each and every day, your expectations aren't met, and it triggers off this tense body, cluttered mind. Now, as first responders, guess what happens to your expectations? Well, here's most people, their expectations in life. We are way up here because we're exposed to crisis and trauma. We know what safety needs to be like. We are constantly having our expectations frustrated because we see the world differently. And then what happens when those expectations shift and turn and get focused on you, that sharp end of the stick? And you're not meeting your own expectations for self and others. Can I ask an honest question? I know you don't believe this about yourself, but where do people hold first responders? On a pedestal. I mean, we can ask our, our civilian here, what do you think of first responders? It's unspeakably valuable. Yeah, we talk about y'all like your heroes, right? Not a single one of you in here is going to say, no, I'm not a hero, Rich. I just do my job. But when you're put on a pedestal and you have these heroic expectations you have to live up to, that's a setup, right? Because what happens when you don't or you can't or you're close to not? And you can't be that person everyone believes you to be. That's when things start to break down. It's these expectations we have of ourselves and others that when they're not met, spin off those storylines and cause that primitive brain to get active. You don't commit suicide in your executive brain. I promise you. It's in that fight, flight, or freeze. The training we provide for the cadets is how do I manage my primitive and executive brain? How do I turn that on and off at, at will? How do I get so proficient at this that it's the norm? That can come in and say, oh, storyline, right? Yeah, I got storyline. What's your storyline? Here's mine. What's yours? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to use that come to the senses mind stuff. Okay, I'm good. Let's, let's process this now in our executive brain. Let's look at it differently. We don't need to rehash the trauma. All we need to say is, what did we learn and gain from this experience? That's how you process traumatic emotions. I don't need to walk you through step by step the sense, how it smelled, what it was like, how you felt. All I need to ask you is, what did you learn from it? That's executive brain processing. If I say, tell me about it, guess where I put you? Primitive brain, right? No, these tools are all meant to say, how did I learn and grow? How did, am I going to take this and become different than I am and gain from it? That's how we take suicide to zero, is through mastery of this process. Would, would that be the best approach for uh, CISM teams, CISD teams? Oh, yeah. I'm going to be real bold. When I come in and work with Mike, I don't have you rehash the trauma. I say, okay, <laughs> what did we learn from this? How are we going to gain? How are we going to grow? Like mistakes you're supposed to make in life, right? 
if I have you rehash the entire mistake for me, the blame, the shame, the guilt, the frustration comes up. You get defensive and aggressive because you're in your primitive brain. You can't process events. So I say, let's shift. What do we learn? Let's take the shame and the blame out. How do we learn and grow from it? And then you can move forward. That's how you process trauma. And that's what crisis teams should be doing. Yes, sir. Uh, can you repeat the question for our, we had a comment on the message board about they can't hear the, the question. So would you mind? Yeah, the, the question is, should crisis response teams have a philosophy of let's learn and grow from this experience instead of rehash? Yes. You, you shouldn't be rehashing. It's okay to do the trauma narrative. Here's what happened. Here's the event, right? But that's where we stop is re, let's just make sure the facts are out there. What are the facts? Okay, and then now that we know the facts, we're all on the same table. You know, do you need to add to it? Okay, we got the facts here. What did we learn? How are we going to grow? How are we going to take this and move forward? Because what's really important? What do we value? Do you value breaking down, shutting down, losing your family, losing everything you love in life? to the point where you want to take your life? Or do you value being able to respond again right next time? Being able to go home and take that vacation, spend that time with family and friends and be okay. You got to process events in the executive brain in order to have that type of experience. And then you have to connect it to what do we value, what's important to us as a team, as a unit, as a platoon, as a group. You do those two things, you can move forward. If those two things aren't present, all you do is rehash it everyone's going to walk away shamed, blamed, frustrated, or angry. And they're like, I'm not going through that process again. That was, that was miserable. Yes, sir. They often say, oh, I'm fine, too. It's to be things to watch. Oh, yeah. Why do you say you're fine? It's to avoid, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's an avoidance technique. First time someone says I'm fine, I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you just don't want to talk about it. And I don't want you to talk about it either. I just want to ask you a question. What did you learn from the experience? And what is it you value in life, and how are we going to make those things work for you? That's what needs to happen. In addition, we can add a few communication skill sets for our partners. Okay? Being connected to a trauma, a first responder, a firefighter is a lot of work. And so it's not just us that needs some training, right? It's our, it's our partners. We have a question, Chief. I just wanted to add maybe a comment, really. So this was a hard transition for us. Most of us have been through several kind of crisis incident uh, debriefings, and it was a different style. And so it was it was hard for our people to accept, really, at first, until they had the training. And once they went through the training, and Rich explained the process, it made sense, and especially when our people got the tools. So once they had tools, then it really, you agree with that? Yeah. It went a long ways for us. And it's really made a difference in how we handle these events now. And you'll see a transition in people wanting to avoid them, and I'm fine, to we need this. <laughs> Let's follow this process so we can get back to what we do well. So that's the training for us. Here's what your partners need, your friends, your family. They need to be able to manage this, these four things. These four things destroy relationships. And we are really good at first responders of keeping this cycle going, OK? We get criticized a lot, or we are very critical. That sets up defensiveness, right? Defensiveness looks like either I give you a nice laundry list of all I do well. For example, I'm in charge of the poop bin at our house for our nine-month-old. And I'm the one that's supposed to take it out. Sometimes I forget. Um, and so. <laughs> If Amber comes in and says, hey, why have you taken out the poop bin? Oh, well, did you see me mow the lawn? Did you see the apples picked up? Did you notice the dishes were done? And I, you make this whole list of everything you do. Or you attack back. Like, oh, yeah, I know the poop bin's full um, because there aren't any garbage bags. You didn't go shopping. <laughs> so defensiveness really creates that conflict. And then it gets into this contempt where you're frustrated, you're angry. This is where you start to spin those storylines I talked about, right? And it just eats at you. And then you stonewall. One of you just shuts down. It tends to be me. Like Amber, I'll be walking. Amber, like, what's up? Fine, everything's good, OK? Nope. It's all good, I promise. <laughs> and you just get that passive aggressive, or you just tune out. And then guess what happens? 
Well, Amber gets critical that I'm tuned out, and it spins and spins. Our partners don't understand why we're hypersensitive trauma, and we need a little bit of support. Here's what we train our partners to do, and here's what we practice ourselves, because we're no, we know we're at risk for being critical and defensive. We use soft startups. So instead of Amber saying, hey, Rich, that poop bin's full. You're a terrible dad. And what kind of dad leaves poop bins full in our child's room, right? She says, you know what? You are the best dad on the planet. If you are, and I'm a, I'm a good dad. I really am a good dad. Can you take out the poop bin? They're totally different, right? Now, all of a sudden, I'm taking the poop out like with a big smile on my face. What a good dad I am. Instead of being all upset that I'm a bad dad because I didn't. Soft startups are so key. And criticism is always built around not having expectations met, followed by a storyline. Well, criticism is experienced in your primitive brain. Guess where a soft startup is experienced? Executive brain functioning. Okay? Then we are open to influence. We call it the sure I will program at our house. Um, so, Rich, <laughs> um, you got the trailer this weekend? I'm really busy. I usually do everything on the outside, and Amber likes the inside. But so, Rich, you got the trailer? I got the trailer. Sure, I will. It's just that openness. Um, where we struggle is my dress attire. Um, so today it was like, will you wear socks and shoes instead of just Birkenstocks? Sure, I will. <laughs> I was open to influence. But that's how you create common value and shared meaning, is when you really start to be open to each other. Five to one has to be present. Call it the emotional bank account. You have to invest at five times for every one withdrawal. Here's the deal. As first responders, because of your job, because of your sacrifice, because of your service to the community, you are taking huge withdrawals from your friends and family, emotional withdrawals. Your work is hard on them too. That needs to be, that investment needs to be pretty solid so you can. It's okay to take those withdrawals. I take a lot from Amber. Um, let me tell you, I come home from a challenging day of responding to a suicide or a death or a police officer shooting or a major crisis in the community. I'm pretty worn out. I'm pretty wiped. I don't want to talk. I don't want to connect. I don't want to do anything. Guess what she lets me do? Guess what she lets me do? Check out. Yeah, that's the withdrawal I need to make, and she honors that. She doesn't come up and give me a big hug and ask me about my day. She'll just come up and say, you need a break. Like, yeah, I need, I need to just check out. We are constantly making withdrawals from our partners, and you've got to make sure there's enough in the account to do so. Finally, turning towards and repair attempts. I'm going to use Joy here because I trust her. So, um, Joy, I'd like you to apologize for being sarcastic. This is like the opposite of Joy. She's like the <laughs> kindest person on the planet. <laughs> but in role play. Rich, I'm sorry for being sick. Yeah, you were. Okay, knock it off, okay? <laughs> How's that going to work in a relationship, right? <laughs> i get some smiles over here. Let's try this again. Oh, no worries. My bad, too. So, we good? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. That meant a lot. How often do we not accept repair attempts in order to punish the person? This is the process we go through to invest in that emotional bank account so when we need to, we can take repairs. We can take withdrawals. So, how do we get suicide to zero? We train us so we can, in our executive brain, process trauma. We build that into our KSAs, and then we provide our partners the tools they need to support us as well. So I'm going to leave you with a challenge. Here's what we're missing. Here's why none of this is happening. It kind of drives me nuts a little bit. It's like we know how to end it, right? We know how to solve it, but we're not able to make that happen, to actualize it. Well, it's because this isn't in place. You put this in place, and you're going to see a significant difference in not just suicide, but in job performance, into relationships, into how people live their day, how they go about their lives. You get a checkup, right, once a year to make sure you're healthy. 
your, you know, your heart's okay, your body's okay, well, why not a mental health checkup that's confidential, that no one knows about, that's private, that's mandatory, that's just part of the job, right? So it's not stigmatized. You go once a year, you work with someone like me, and we say, hey, you need this level of support. Here's how we're going to go about doing it. We got your back. Here's the tools that, that are gapped. Why are we not doing presentations like this on a regular basis to everybody? Teaching the basic skill sets, the warning signs, what it's going to look like, and building this into our daily training. I mean, honestly, as first responders, how often do you train to be prepared for a crisis? I have a minimum of 40 CEUs a year I have to accomplish to maintain my just clinical license. But as a professor, it is a constant state of training to be prepared in the classroom, right? The training never stops. Why is there no training for your mind? No training that's built into regular daily KSAs. Why is this not as much a part of pulling on your outfit, putting on your gloves, whatever it is, whatever tools you use to be successful, why is the mind stuff not there as well? And it's inexpensive and easy to implement. It doesn't cost $6,500. There needs to be a stress response team leader. Someone like Matt Hoverville here, who has the knowledge and skills to say, you're struggling, I know what to do. I know where to take you. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not the person that's gonna see you. I'm the person that's gonna facilitate this. I'm the one that's the lead that says, this is okay, this is the norm. We're not going to ostracize, shame, blame. We're not going to point fingers because someone needs someone like me. This becomes the norm, becomes the example. This is what needs to be part of every team. And that team leader needs to make sure those KSAs are happening, the training's occurring. And then finally, your peer support teams, your EAPs, they need to understand trauma, really what it looks like as it's beginning to emerge, and how to get a person from primitive to executive brain functioning so that the norm is resiliency, not the exception. Okay, that's the presentation all, so I'm wide open to questions or whatever thoughts you have. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I know you're doing a really summarized version. Yes. So now you're, we're moving into the clinical realm. So what do I do as a professional? Yeah. Well, first I build a relationship with them. We get to know each other. I do a full assessment so I understand the symptoms, what's going on. I look at the trauma narrative, which is a brief overview. Then we start to look at how it's impacting their life. We do a compare and contrast. Once we're three to six weeks into it, they trust me, I trust them. We've had some basic skill sets to desensitize from that. I say, okay. Can I have your permission to take you somewhere that's going to be hard? But it's the answer. And then we do a little bit of what we call motivational interviewing. to say, if this is what you value, family, connectiveness, being able to sleep, not having to worry about what's ongoing. If that's what you want, I've got to take you to a really challenging place. And here's the question I've got to ask you. Can I ask you? They're going to say, OK, Rich, what did you learn from this? That's, we don't just jump in day one <laughs> with that question. That's the end goal, and it takes me several weeks to get the client to that place where they're willing to look at it through those eyes. Very good question. Yeah, in the midst of a crisis, it's safety, security, it's normalization, it's looking at the facts, it's trying to create a sense of normalization and getting things back to homeostasis. Post crisis, if they're starting to experience those symptoms of PTSD, that's when we go into the clinical process of moving them towards growth and learning. Is that? Yep. Okay. Yes. There are both. There are standard, um, what we call standardized clinical questionnaires 
and they're also all the way to just observational, non-screening tools where I, as a professional, know what questions to ask. So, yeah. Um, the thing is, I know every first responder on this. Now, PTSD isn't like the same for everybody. It's on a spectrum, right? Everybody in here, you've got a little bit of it because <laughs> you've been exposed to trauma. Um, what we look at not so much as do you have it, how's it impacting you? Your life, your marriage, your friends, your family, your work, your mood. That's what the focus is. If it's having a significant impact on you as a person, then we say let's figure out what tools are going to best fit so you can get back to you. I like my PTSD. <laughs> I just don't like what it does to me when I'm in my primitive brain. Because I'm a much different person because of what I've experienced. In a much good, in a really good way. Yes, sir. What would you advise somebody that says, say they do have PTSD and they have um, seek counseling? Um, numerous, from numerous people and have never got anything resolved. What would you, what would you recommend to that person? That's a tough question to answer. Um, I'd say you need a really good therapist, someone who's going to ask the right questions. I need to understand what, how the trauma is impacting you, why you're not getting relief, what specific areas, what you've done in the past that has and hasn't worked. I'd want to look at and do a strengths assessment. Like, who are you as a person inside? How, how do you get through things? Um, how have others in your life gotten through things? And after I have that full assessment, I really understand the person. And we're going to figure out how to take all of that and move forward. But I'm going to tell them that don't give up hope. We just haven't connected you to the right person yet, the right process. Because you can 100% manage PTSD. 100%. But it's got to be the right process. They also have to be willing to accept it. Absolutely. And learn and grow from it. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> guilty, too. Um, avoidance um, is, is a wonderful coping mechanism, right? Yeah, absolutely. And not just accept it, but realize it's going to be part of me, right? I mean, every experience you have is part of you, right? The good and the bad. I could ask you all right now, think of one of your favorite memories, right? I tell you about Luke and I paddleboarding, and you'd feel this amazing, overwhelming emotion, like almost like you're back there. Well, the same thing happens with trauma. You just need to learn how to manage those memories in a way that doesn't shut you down and activate your primitive brain. So I'd say... I've got someone that can help you. <laughs> Rich, what do we do as the peer support team? So, not that we don't want your help, but so that we can keep them from getting that far. Do right. we start talking to them about what have you learned and, and everything like that right off instead of, you know, I mean, I know if you see ASM, it's like, you know, they rehash everything over and over and over again. Right. So answer your question, what can you do? Where the, where's the place to start? Well, look where Chief Fox and Matt are starting. We're bringing this concern to our awareness. It's got to be the norm. It's got to be talked about like it's the same training you get for anything you do. Like I cannot tell you how many, how many KSAs I went through for how to put on plastic gloves, right? Uh, how to wash my hands afterwards. <laughs> what to do if I'm exposed to foreign chemicals. How much training have you gone through that talks about what to do if your mind's challenged by a trauma. Zero. It has to be just like putting on a pair of gloves. That's where I'd like to see the peer support teams take this to. So that it's not a stigma, it's not a fear, it's not a worry, a concern. It's, this is what I do. I, I, I can see the prick, or I can see what's going on here, just as easily as I can see what's going on out here. And I know the process. And you're the person that I can trust to help me facilitate it. You're the person I know has my back. Does that answer that for yeah. you? Okay. Is there anything online? Nope. Okay. Thank you all for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, one thing I failed to mention before uh, before we got going is. Uh, we're in the process of creating, this, this event was live streamed, so those of you that watched online, thank you. We had a fairly large uh, online audience considering the time frame we had to work with, so we're looking forward to growing that. Um, how that's going to be done, there will be a dedicated website.
for this meeting group. So we can live stream these lectures across the country. Uh, we, we did have a lot of people from across Utah watch today, and we look forward to spreading this message of first responders and mental health and bringing these worlds together. And we now have a vehicle of which we're going to be able to do that on a grander scale. So uh, look forward to those changes as we come forward. Um, again, thank you so much, Rich, for coming. Thank you guys for coming. Um, and other than that, um, unless anybody else has anything else, we're good I to do. go. Would you send, share these slides back with mm -hmm. us yeah. from Rich somehow? Yep. I would appreciate that anyway. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for coming.